All right. Looks like we are at the top of the hour. So I'm going to get this done short and sweet. Okay. Personal question for you. How the heck are we already in the middle of September? This is nuts. This is just nuts. Um, looking It'll at the rest of the calendar. You know What's that? It'll be Thanksgiving before you know it. Or Halloween, oh, yeah. I guess, is the next one. I, I'm, yeah. I'm okay with both of those. Spooky holidays and food holidays are what, yeah. that's my bread and butter, right? Candy, so. candy then turkey. I'm, I'm okay. Candy, then turkey. High five. Um, September 21st, one week from today, we've got monitoring and troubleshooting Kubernetes. Speaking of Kubernetes, and uh, we got Tim George and Mira Menon coming back, the two awesome, awesome Kubernetes folks. Um, going to be really VROP focus, which is good. We seem to be doing every other week VROPs and, and automation. Um, and then wrapping up the month of September, looks like, uh, oh, uh, Vincent and Maher. So that'll be fun. <laughs> um, and then automating the deployment of Kubernetes clusters. So got a two, Kubernetes twofer. We've got an ops, ops and an auto there. Yeah. And looking forward to the 5th of October, looks like Tim George is coming back with extending your solutions with uh, management packs. So going to be super ops heavy there. Uh, really good. And we've got, well, you are going to be busy next month, my friend. I know. Well, next couple of weeks at least, right? So that'll be good. So yeah, so so um, we don't have the invites out for October yet. Um, but the but September, check on the blogs.vmware.com forward slash management and you'll find the uh, find the social link to the next upcoming meetings. And those are all those will also be uh, uh, promoted through uh, Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn. So you can find the links there. Of course, Twitter doesn't have a pre reg um, for the for the operations sessions. Um, but you can always come onto the Twitter live account day of uh, you'll know when those are pretty much every Thursday show up now in November. Um, we're going to be probably going 100% onto the uh, Bright Talk format, which we've been doing every other week. It was just an internal thing, so we're getting that fixed up. But then those will be sent out by the social channels so that you can watch those um, through the social channels as, as a recorded session. So you definitely want to show up live with your live Q&A. Um, you can also uh, ask your questions on the social channels if you want, if you've got questions ahead of time. But we look forward to interacting with you. That's why we're here. That's why we have the experts here to talk to you, um, because we we want you to drive this conversation as much as we want to present it. So bring, bring your questions, thoughts, and feelings, and we'll get you taken care of. So with that, um, I'm... I'm out of here. I think I think it's it's all your turn. So uh, I will I will duck out and, and get started. All right. Thanks, Anders. Um, hey, everyone. So um, I'm back. I've been doing a few of these uh, recently, but uh, I want to just intro myself, introduce myself uh, in case you haven't been watching. So my name is uh, Vincent Riccio. I'm a senior manager in the technical marketing uh, group at, here at VMware. Um, essentially, I focus mostly on our automation solutions around, uh, you know, RE Automation, RE Automation Config, uh, which was formerly our Assault Stack uh, Config product, uh, which is what we're going to focus on a little bit today, as well as some other things as well. Um, but, uh, but primarily around sort of how do we automate and manage uh, policies and stuff like that in your in your in your multi cloud environments. <clears throat> so glad to be here, um, and uh, let's just kind of go ahead and get started. Uh, so the title of this one is uh, Everything VMware ARIA, uh, Manage Applications and Services Using VMware ARIA Automation Config. So we've done some uh, webinars already around ARIA Automation Config, but what I'm going to do today is I'm going to drill in just a little bit more into the states and how we can use those, and as well as jobs and some other uh, features, I guess, uh, around managing apps and services in your operating systems, um, you know, both Windows and Linux, uh, because, you know, there are, there are lots of options and capabilities uh, to manage Windows uh, from everything from patching uh, to, you know, uh, they even have a Win repo, which I'll go over a little bit. There's a bunch of states in it to install applications and all kinds of fun stuff on Windows. Um, and then, of course, Linux, uh, where there's a package installer as well as a service module um, that helps us to... Uh, 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 do a bunch of stuff there. Now, what's kind of nice about this uh, in terms of managing services, um, and and uh, also, you know, I'll, I'll kind of talk a little bit about, uh, I probably won't demo it too much, but there's, uh, you know, obviously capabilities to just run scripts within this product. Um, so there's actually a CMD run uh, and sort of way to run PowerShell scripts or local bash scripts 
um, on these systems. Um, and so, you know, there's kind of this saying, you know, when in doubt, shell out in a sense. Uh, so if, if we can't really always, if there's a module that maybe is lacking something very specific that you need, we can always shell out and run commands. And that's helped me out in a few ways as well. So we'll kind of talk about maybe some best practices like that, um, as well as, uh, uh, some other stuff here. Let me see if PowerPoint will work with me. Okay, so in this session, we're gonna we're gonna really focus on how do you state files to deploy applications and services. Um, and so I'm gonna show you state files that will help us, uh, you know, deploy packages um, and so forth. And we're gonna dive in a little bit into uh, sort of the uh, anatomy of a state file. Uh, I'm gonna go over that a little bit too because it's hard to sort of just look at a state file and go, okay, what is this? What does that mean? Um, within SALT and, and, uh, and so forth. And uh, so we'll get into that a little bit. So some of this other stuff will make sense once we get into that piece. So I'll talk a little bit about the different, uh, you know, renders, uh, what uh, scripting languages we can use, um, as well as uh, what are some of the key modules that you want to be aware of. And I'll probably even dive into some of the documentation um, as well, since that could be relevant. Um, and then learn how to take day two actions to manage and get information about services. We can also take day two actions on just about anything SALT manages, right? Um, uh, your applications, your, your, your machines themselves, et cetera. But I'll focus a little bit more on the services just for the sake of time in the sense of being able to get a list of services from machines, stop those services, start those services. Uh, there, there's a lot of different things we can do and we can run jobs, schedule jobs, um, or just run, uh, there's various ways to kind of kick off the states uh, to do that sort of thing for us. We'll even get into a little bit, and I didn't put it in here, but we'll get a little bit into the reactor beacon again, uh, just because when you talk about uh, services and let's say uh, application files themselves, uh, reactors and beacons can be very helpful to keep things in a certain state and remediate stuff um, and get things back up and running in case a service fails. So we'll talk a little about that as well. Um, and at the end of the session, hopefully we could create a basic state file that installs you know, some apps and services. Um, and then we'll learn how to run jobs and add all commands uh, to manage the services. So what I mean by a job, because I don't know if I really go into this under the PowerPoint, but um, a job is really a predefined set of, of, of tasks you want to do within a job. So a job could be, okay, I want to do a service stop against, you know, and, and have the user at the time uh, requesting the job to pick from a, a, a drop down of services, right? So maybe we want to stop Apache or Nginx or, or any kind of service or something like that. And that would be a job. So you go in the job section, you see the job, and then you run that job and it does something. Maybe it installs software or it does whatever kind of command we want. Ad hoc commands are just that, they're ad hoc um, in the sense that we would click on a machine and then we would run the command right there. We wouldn't necessarily have a job. It's just, hey, I want to go in, quickly restart something or do something maybe I don't have a job for or uh, you know, maybe there's uh, just something I need to do quickly. Now, of course, we typically don't recommend just going in and letting anybody be able to do ad hoc commands uh, within the system. So we usually want to reserve that for, you know, let's say your administrators or folks that, you know, um, uh, if it's a test environment, you know, maybe that's different for like your production machines. You want to be careful, obviously, with ad hoc commands. But I do want to at least kind of go over it a little bit so you know that option is there. But again, uh, use with caution because uh, if you run an ad hoc command, it's going to run that command right there. And uh, it may have not been tried and tested uh, before. So we just going to make sure that we're a little careful with those. But it's very useful uh, for doing things that uh, maybe you don't have jobs for. Okay, so RE Automation Config, um, let's just look at this real quick. Um, so the challenge, right, uh, is really, you know, you have sort of this fleet of, of systems out there. And, and what, what our, uh, VMware RE Automation Config does essentially is it sits on top of your salt stack environment. Uh, so you have your salt stack architecture, uh, your controllers, your minions, all that stuff out there. And essentially what, what our, our automation, our VMware Automation Config does is it helps you to kind of you know, manage all of that from a single interface. So you have an API and a UI that you can use uh, to essentially go in and manage all these servers, manage all these systems, target, put a bunch of machines into a target group or like kind of group them based on certain criteria and then run jobs and commands against those systems um, or target them through what we'll call a top file, which we'll get into a little bit as well. Um, and so, you know, it's it's really kind of at scale too because Salt is a very scalable system. Uh, it's an event-based uh, system based on Python. 
Uh, and so you can manage things at a very high scale. And then we can also remediate uh, through various actions and then also create consistency across the environment through our states and, and high, what we call high state or, or applying a top file based on certain criteria as well, which will go look at all those systems that have that criteria and then apply a certain state to them. And we could schedule those kind of things, et cetera. So really what we're doing is we're saying, okay, you know, uh, put an agent on the machine or we can go agent list too. But if you have that agent, what's nice about the agent when we talk about the built-in OS configuration management is you get the advantages of an event bus. And the event bus allows us to do real-time uh, remediation of something like a service stopping or an application file getting misconfigured. Uh, so we can do things like that. Um, so what are some of the top use cases? Um, you know, full stack orchestration. You know, if you really look at kind of, uh, 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 you know, sort of the history of the product of, of Salt itself, right? Orchestration and, and running commands uh, against a fleet of machines has really been sort of, you know, sort of the, the, the genesis of the product. So orchestration allows us to do a number of things. When I talk about these state files in a second, we're going to basically talk about individual states, but you can tie these together to create one big orchestration. And there's also types of files that we can run that will, you know, call a bunch of different states for us. So there's ways you can orchestrate a whole system together or a bunch of things. And event-driven action, like I talked about, that's where we want that agent on the on the machine. So that way we can go in and have this event-driven action. So there's a couple of benefits to that. One, you get the benefit of that reactor beacon where we can look at a change in the system, bring it back to where it needs to be. Two, we can also, uh, a look at the event bus uh, to do any kind of troubleshooting or look for events that have occurred and make sure that things are configured properly. Um, and uh, also get more real time uh, data coming in from our machines that we're managing. Uh, so we can look at their state, we can get information from them coming in through the event bus. Um, and then speed, right? Uh, we can do things very quickly at scale because of that. Um, and then empower your developers, right? Deliver that cloud consumption experience um, and, and so forth. Okay. Um, I guess what I'll do is I will go into the salt state file itself. Um, and what I'm going to do here in a second as well, I'm going to go through my, my PowerPoint. Um, and I'll go through these, these slides. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'll jump into probably some of the docs and I'll show you some examples, uh, additional examples, and then we'll go into the product. Um, or I might do the product first. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Um, but uh, but in, in, if this is a little basic, please bear with me if you're very familiar with, with, with salt states already. But I want to make sure that before we jump into looking at, hey, here's a great state file that does a bunch of stuff, um, that you kind of understand what you're, you're looking at. So in salt, um, and I say salt because this can be used with the open source project as well. Um, and our config can can run these states as well. Okay, but essentially they're they're called a salt state file, even if they're in our config, you would just still say they're a state file. Um, so, th but they're they basically have a .sls. So the 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 state files have a .sls extension to them, um, and they have essentially a certain components. So when you run these, um, essentially you're going to have sort of these uh, uh, states. Uh, within your state files. So for instance, um, you could have three or four different states. So that example on the right-hand side, where you see identifier and then module function, and that would be your state. Um, and then example that SLS is your state file, right? So the identifier uh, is a couple of different things. It's really your declaration. So you can use that in one of two ways. There's a, a legacy method where you can actually run uh, the name of your function there. Um, or you can just use it as an identifier. So you can call it whatever you want. So that way you can, uh, you know, just sort of identify it right through, through readable general uh, text versus having to understand what the name of a function is doing. Uh, so, so, and that's generally, in my opinion, the best practice is put something there uh, because it makes it easier if you do things like requisites um, where you're calling different states from another state. So for instance, you can have requisites in one state that would say, hey, don't run that that top state, that state above it, until it shows success. And then you can run the state below it, right? So you can have these requisites like uh, require, require, uh, watch, and all these other things. And it just makes it easier if you have that identifier. Plus, if someone else comes to look at your script later, right, um, and needs to understand what you're doing in that state, uh, it's just easier if you say installing Apache or something, right, uh, versus, uh, you know, some some command there. And then the module function. So the way that Python works, I mean, sorry, the way that uh, Salt works 
is the states come from a state module ultimately, and then there's a, a, uh, uh, a general module, like an execution module and so forth. But to, to make it a little bit easier, what happens in these, in these modules is they're Python based. So you'll basically have a module, like let's say we're gonna look at a module called PKG uh, for package installation. So the module name is PKG and that's your general module file. And that's going to have all its functions in it. So if you're familiar with Python, right, you have you have this general module, but then a bunch of functions in there, and you pass arguments, right? So generally with the Python function, you pass arguments to the function to the function. So what we're going to have is our module, the name of the module, and then the function within there. So a function within, like let's say, package module could be install. And within that install Python function, you will have arguments. So the arguments could be, you know, function arg, function arg, function arg. Right, and then the name of the function, right, or the you know, so so there's different uh, 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 things that we do, but what the name value basically depending on what the function is. So let's say the function is install. Well, the name could be the package you're going to install, right? Um, and then the function args could be other things like um, you know uh, uh, anything else we need to pass, whether they're optional or required uh, to 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 configure it. And then the state um, is the name of the state module. Um, so we just talked about that. And then the function of the name. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and then arguments are just kind of your, your traditional arguments. Okay. So that's kind of the example. And this, this is sort of the layout. So when you look at this, uh, most of our functions, uh, our states are going to look like this. Um, we might have some different little formats here and there. Uh, because you can also inject Jinja and stuff like that into these states, which could change the way they look. But we won't get it. We won't deep dive into that, but we will have a, a small uh, uh, section on that in the PowerPoint. Okay, so kind of an example of a state, and I believe this is one that's just kind of out of the box that comes with uh, the product. Um, and uh, so we can see that they're basically used to deploy infrastructure and services and stuff like that. Uh, copy files, uh, do things to files, make changes to files, uh, you know, run services, install packages and stuff like that. Now, um, one of the benefits is that they contain multi-language renders. So if you look on the left-hand side, let's just kind of look a little bit at, you know, what we're seeing here. So before, remember in the previous slide, we had the name. So we're giving them this sort of a, a nice name, say deploy NTP file. So we know that that's what it's actually doing. This isn't actually uh, doing anything other than just helping us understand what all this stuff is doing. Now, I mentioned there was a, an older way to do it as well. Like I could put this whole thing right here, up here, and then just have source and make directories down here under file manage. That's another way to do it. So you might see states uh, in some of the state files out there that look like that. But generally these days, you're going to see it mostly where we're giving an identifier and then uh, your file managed here. So file managed basically does just what you might think it does. It helps you manage files. So you can either create a file, um, uh, you know, copy a file, uh, uh, change a file, uh, things like that. So here we want to, uh, oops, sorry, where'd I go? So I'm, I'm clicking on my mouse too much. Um, so essentially uh, uh, what we're doing is we're saying we want to uh, create a file, uh, there's the source of where we want to get the file from, and then if we need to make the directory, let's make the directory. Okay, and so that's your that, and so that file is the module manages the function, and then uh, those arguments getting passed uh, below. Uh, so below that, we have another state uh, that is going to ensure that that service is running. So when we see service dot running. What it will do is it will start the service if it's not started, or it will just come back and say, hey, this is running. Just ensuring that it is running. Uh, so we want to ensure system D time sync D is running. And if you notice that watch uh, option there, that was that requisite that I talked about previously, where um, this is going to look to see, you know, are there changes that the plan to be file? If there are, then uh, we, we may need to just go ahead and make sure the service is running, okay, uh, and so forth. So there's ways to sort of, uh, you know, uh, create these integrate uh, these sort of dependencies and, and requisites uh, and so forth. Um, so that's kind of the idea of it. Um, it also says on the right side, uh, multi-language renderers. And so I want to just talk about that for a second. And in the state files, essentially, uh, the, the really kind of the default is Jinja YAML. That's what it's going to render. Okay. When I say Jinja YAML, uh, you know, you don't need Jinja, but let's say you just write one in all of YAML or your state file all YAML. It it renders that in YAML. It just goes through a render and renders it. If you have Jinja for like variables or pulling data from other things like pillar or your grains. 
and salt, then it renders that first. So it'll go, you know, ginger, yaml, and but there's other language renders as well. There's Python, uh, there's JSON, uh, and 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 a number of others. They're listed out on the documentation. So you could actually write the state file in Python, um, or you could write it in JSON, and it will render that language without actually having to install. Uh, any plugins or anything else. Uh, those are just kind of built in capabilities of the system, which makes it kind of nice. Um, a YAML is going to be your default, probably what you'll typically do, but you might have situations where, uh, you know, another language might be more what your company uses or what the folks that generally want to write these kind of scripts want to use uh, for various reasons uh, to, to get those capabilities. Okay, I got to kind of hurry here. So uh, top files, I'm not going to dive into this too much. This is really kind of one way to ensure the environment has sort of a, a uh, you know, a, a certain state or a certain type of configuration that and, and ensure that's consistent and uh, across a different, maybe a fleet of systems. This is generally helpful when you have a fleet of systems that you need to ensure they have a certain type of config. So for instance, if we look on the right-hand side, um, this is a top file. So there's a concept inside of Salt Call it top SLS file, and we we generally might refer this to refer this as a high state as well. Um, and essentially, what this top SLS is doing is it's saying, okay, from the base, we're going to pull our states from the base, which is the default directory for our state files inside of Salt. Um, and all of the systems, because we have an asterisk there, need to have this core state file associated with them. So the core state file might be, you know, these particular apps need to be installed on every system. Um, you know, this firewall rule needs to be installed in every system. Something needs to be installed on every system that's being managed uh, by that salt system, okay? Uh, and that's that core. Now, for anything that has, uh, let's say, OS Ubuntu, if it's, if it's an operating system Ubuntu, then we also need to run uh, this other state file, right? Or if it's a Red Hat system, we need to run that. So, um, or if it's like, a, you know, has a grain of some sort, like maybe a, a app web or something like that, then we want to run these other uh, type of state files, okay? So this is a way, and, and so once this is run, whether it's scheduled or just uh, manually uh, uh, executed, then it's going to look at systems that match these criteria and just run these states against it. So it's a really nice way to keep organized, make sure you're running all the correct states against your system versus having to kind of go in and, and sort of figure it out yourself right over and over again. Okay, so I think we get the idea of that. Um, I talked a little bit about this already, uh, so I might just go through this a little quickly. Um, but yeah, so there's language variations, there's YAML, Python, JSON, which are probably the three most common things you'll see um, uh, out there, right? Um, you know, some some being a little more efficient than others in, in certain areas, but, um, you know, that's, that's sort of a, a, a really kind of just user, whatever's best fits your needs and, and so forth. Um, if you look on the left-hand side, uh, then, you know, you'll see just uh, a couple of examples. We're going to look at some things on, like around that package install, right, and list your packages out. At the top, what we're doing essentially is uh, where you see that set username equal, we're just setting variables uh, using Jinja um, to say, you know, where, where we see that username uh, uh, option, like here's username, and then we, we plug that variable there. But we're going to get that username from uh, what we call pillar data, uh, which can be preset or inputted from the user. So uh, there's there's some uh, you know information that we can get uh, from uh, maybe a, another environment that we've set it up in. Okay, um, and then here's the Jinja state render. So I, I kind of just threw this in here because in a lot of state files uh, that you see, especially when you start working with state files that have been created by other folks, if you go out to like some of the GitHub pages. Uh, for salt, and you start bringing down examples uh, for uh, like like uh, you know different kind of applications and and uh, so forth, uh, then you know you're going to probably see Jinja, and you're probably going to see these type of things where we're setting variables, pulling data from different sources, uh, setting file paths, and then injecting that data in there, and then also running like if else statements and so forth. So we need to make sure that uh, you know not not make sure you're you're really solely comfortable with Jinja, but most likely as you write your states, you will have needs for Jinja. And that will be mostly because you want to um, have one place to change something or you're getting information from another source like Pillar uh, or you're just pulling data in from the, the grains library or dictionary. 
right? Because uh, there's there's this concept in salt of a grain that I that's a lot of metadata about a system, and you may want to pull that into here. Uh, that's a dictionary essentially that we can pull from uh, and set that as a as a variable uh, or pull that data in and then put that in our states. Uh, so it's very helpful um, in that in that respect. And there there's a render uh, for that itself. Okay, so um, let's look at just the following state declaration in YAML, right? Um, so we have the common packages, which is the identifier. We have the package dot installed, and then the packages that we're going to install. So when this state file is executed, it's going to do two things. One, it will install the packages if they're not there. If they are there, it's going to simply just come back and say, these packages are installed. I don't need to do anything else. Um, so it'll come back and just say, there you are installed. Now that's going to translate to common packages PKG installed that that line below it. Now, if you go and look at the event bus, something like that, you may see that type of format um, as well, right? And you can actually run this as a um, an execution command uh, as well, but we won't really get into that too much. So when you're writing these, um, you could say something like if data ID equals such and such, then apply a uh, uh, a state file called, uh, you know, MySQL or, so, or run the high state, run the top file. Now, what we're doing here is we're saying if the minion ID, because we're pulling the ID of the system, equals that MySQL 1, then we're going to run a high state against it. And then we're going to do basically a, a, a MySQL 1. So what we want to do is identify systems with that ID. When you create a minion, in salt which is a machine you are managing then they will have an id associated with them and and that's called the minion id and you can write these uh, jinja commands to essentially say if that name is equal to something then do something so we use that quite a bit actually uh for a lot of examples we do and the things that we do even in our labs okay and so that's just kind of one option there now let me go into another concept here before i jump into the the demo and, and some of the docs and stuff um, is when you're dealing with services, okay, and you're dealing with applications within Salt, understanding the reactor beacon service can be very, very helpful. And I'll give you a couple of examples before I get into the, the tech of it, of the technology. One is you could have, like, let's say um, a web server, right, uh, that has, let's say, a, a, a PHP script or, you know, something like that. And you have it set up in a certain way. Well, if that if you were to get like I don't know maybe I don't want to say hacked, but someone goes in and changes something, right? <laughs> Whether it was intentional or or mischievous, uh, you know, you can essentially, uh, you know, you you want to be able to recover from that immediately, right? So, the reactor service can look at that file and and watch that file for changes, and if there's a change to that file. The reactor beacon server, I'll talk about a beacon here in a second, can go in and say, okay, that file changed. It should not have changed. So let's go in and get it back to where it needs to be. And you can tell it what state file needs to run. That state file could point to your script, uh, your original script, and then it reapply that. So you would do a file manage and just bring down the right file again. And so that's a way to just have that happen automatically for you. Uh, so that way you can get up and running. So that's really if you're kind of dealing more with a, a file like in your uh, in your web server or on your database server, or wherever any minion you're you're uh, you're managing. The other kind of uh, I guess use case for this would be for a service. And so, for instance, we can have the reactor server reactor system. You know, remember, we're on an event bus here. So this event bus is you know the minions are talking uh, to your systems. Right, and the, the minions are talking. They're saying, "Okay, this this is fine." And what we can do is we can create a state file that says, "Look at the Apache the service on these systems, and if they were to uh, fail, then I want to run this state file." Right, and so if, um, if the Apache two system is not in a starting state, then I want to run this state file. So if there's any change to it, right, let's let's run that state file. And the state file could be if the service name running equals false and it equals Apache 2, then go ahead and start it. So this is the argument for the service start. And then we're going to put the ID of the machine. So essentially what this is doing is saying, hey, machine one over here, uh, the Apache service stopped. 
So let's go ahead and kick it off again. And we just run a simple state called local service dot start with that mod module and function. And then we start it back up again. And that happens automatically if you have the agent on the minion and you're running your reactor file system. Now, all you need to do for to, to create a reactor is essentially create a reactor file like this. The 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 service is started automatically on the on the controller. So you have that, and then you have your minions. Okay. Uh, so I won't deep deep dive into this because we've probably gone through this before, but that's essentially what the reactor is doing. And all you have to do is you just need to put this reactor.conf file in this directory, um, and uh, uh, and then and then essentially the state file uh, could be you know in in your states directory. All right, so let's go into the beacon real quick. So the reactor is looking for the is is going to tell the system what to do when the change happens. But beacons can help you with telling the help to tell the reactor that something did actually change. So the reactor could look at things without a beacon too if there are certain events that are just generally going to occur in the system. But what a beacon does is it gives you a very a way to specify something that could happen in the system that you want to recover from. So for instance, in this case, we have a beacon, and these will get put onto your minion systems that says, okay, if the service Apache 2 changes or something changes to that service, the state of it changes, then report that back up to the event bus. So the beacon will go, oh, hey, the Apache 2 service stopped. I need to report that to the event bus. The beacon reports that up to the event bus, and then the reactor picks up on that. So the reactor is going to pick up on um, the fact that this actually is running. It's going to uh, basically look for something like this, remember salt beacon, then the asterisk service Apache 2 that we saw in the reactor file. And then essentially, it's going to go, hey, I see that. What do I do about it, reactor file? Oh, hey, reactor file, this is what you need to do about it. You need to run the, the state that's in this directory called service.sls. And then it goes in and starts it. So those two things can work together. So this could be a file, um, or it could also be a service uh, as well. Okay, so just wanted to kind of bring that up, um, just for the sake of um, uh, you know being able to kind of get some some context here. Okay, so let me jump into uh, the system here, and let's take a look at this. Um, while I'm logging in here, though, what I want to do real quick is I want to just go through and show you a couple things. So obviously we're not going to have all the the uh, the arguments memorized, right, and all the different functions and all that kind of stuff. So that's where documentation comes in, right? So um, under the the docs.saltproject.io, we have um, all the modules and everything over here, all the salt modules that you have, you know, availability for. So what you can do is you can create your states with these um, or run these, you know, as as ad hoc commands. Um, but you could, you know, system service disable, and then it's going to show you the arguments that can be passed. So I don't know if they're, yeah, like maybe enable and then, you know, uh, root or unmask, things like that. Uh, let me go in here and see if there's like, yeah, there's like get them all, get all your services. And then let me look at restart, show, start. Yeah, so here's like start. So if you want to start the service, right, you can run this, this command uh, or put that in your state file. Um, and then do that. So all these are, you know, documented. Uh, so it's nice to kind of come in here and get an idea. If you're ever wondering what arguments uh, you can pass, uh, they will be documented here. Um, we're going to talk a little about uh, these two things in a second. So I'll, I'll jump back over there here in just a second. Okay. So within the in the um, uh, UI itself uh, for VMware Automation Config, um, we can we can target we can group machines together. We probably talked about this in a previous webinar, but you know, for instance, we could have like Apache machines here, and here's like the target criteria, right? As long as they have some kind of web in their name or something like that, uh, right? So because uh, web is here in the name, uh, this gets put into the Apache service. So we're basically um, uh, saying, okay, if the grain ID has its value, so we have our glob here, which is essentially um, uh, the uh, the asterisk and then web, then we want to throw that machine into this target group. And what's nice about that is then later when I run jobs or um, I want to target machines, <laughs> in a sense, then I have all of my Apache servers here in this one group. And uh, then I can click on it and look at activity and stuff like that. So let's see how we kind of got here to actually install this. Let's look at the um, state files and so forth. Let me actually go in here and look at a couple others. So we actually have this open cart 
uh, application as well um, that uh, where we have uh, a machine here that's running uh, the open cart application this is essentially a web server now one thing we can do here as well is we can look at the activity um, on this particular system so we can look at whatever occurred here so we can see that uh, the the job ID and when we go into the job ID we can look at uh, essentially what what occurred so we can see that uh, the beacon was installed on the machine because we're probably going to look at services and so forth. Uh, and then we can also get like raw data here about what happened with that particular state. Okay, so these are just just ways to kind of target things. I may or may not come back here if I have time uh, and so forth. But let's go ahead and go into the main area that we want to talk about first, which is our file server. Now, just for the sake of uh, a demo, I'm going to just do everything from the file server here. Um, your states don't necessarily have to be here in the file server um, you can also uh, have states uh, local on on machines uh, and then and then we can uh, there's ways to sort of execute those as well um, there are different uh, sort of architectures around where your states may live uh, and how you may actually wind up executing them uh, but for the sake of the demo here I'll do it here because it's just kind of easier to get around uh, versus then uh, going into like the command line. Okay, so uh, yeah, I want to go into demo. So essentially what, we, what we've done is we've got some minions here that we've installed IS on, we've installed our beacon, we've installed this open cart app, and we have our reactor. So let me kind of start with open cart first, and then we'll go back to the menu that open cart, and we'll, we'll take a look at, you know, ultimately what happened here. So I've got my state files. Um, normally when you are initially going to start the uh, you know a, a install of an application or a, through states or services through states, you might have an init.sls. That's a special file with install salt that's that allows you to just specify the directory uh, to kick off the install. Uh, so we don't have to specify a file name. Now you might have named this uh, you know kick off installation or start the installation. Then when you run your commands, you would have to know that file name and then specify that file name. But if you just call it init.sls, it just knows, hey, this is the first file I need to run. And it, you don't have to specify init.sls in your commands. So essentially in this one, what we're doing um, is we're using a little Jinja to get the username and password, but we're going to create a user um, and, uh, and put them into groups, put this user into groups. And then essentially what we're going to do is um, install a bunch of packages. Okay, So we're going to say, you know, package.install, right? So if I say package.install in all my packages here, uh, the one I want to do is I might say, well, what other type of, uh, you know, functions would I have for PKG and what arguments can I pass? So in this particular case, right, we're going to do package.installs and we're going to install a number of packages, MySQL, uh, Apache 2, PHP, you know, Python, all this stuff. And uh, then essentially we're going to, you know, th these are the packages we want to get installed. Now, if we want to go in and look a little deeper, we can go into the doc. And there's there's two types of, uh, right now I'm in a states, uh, salt.states documentation. Here I was in salt.module. So the module is the underlying module. The states documentation will show you how to build the states based on that module. So there's a PKG module documentation too, but I'm going to just show you the states version of it. Uh, so that way, you know, because sometimes this may be where you want to go because essentially you're going to be writing states. Um, and so you may want to just kind of say, okay, well, let me see how I write those states. So package.install gives you the ability uh, to, to, so you can see kind of how it's formatted in the state. So you can also manage them. Right, and then also installed, and then down here, here it'll show you a little bit more about the uh, the the arguments and stuff like that. So there's downloaded, um, there's you know group installed, uh, and so forth. So there's installed here. So let's look at this one real quick. So there's package not installed, and essentially what we're doing is you know a very simple state will be my package package not installed, and then the the packages that you want to install. Um, and and then so forth. And so here we can look at maybe a certain version. Uh, so here we're going to install Vim Enhanced, and we're going to have, you know, this is the version that we want to install. So remember earlier I said sometimes you can run the name of the uh, of the package or the service here. Uh, so that's what they kind of did uh, in that example. Uh, here they're just looking at common packages. That's the identifier, and then running different packages, and uh, then you can specify a version for the minion if you want to install that. Okay, um, and so forth. So. Uh, so it's kind of helpful to go through here. 
look at some of these examples, um, and then you can see all the arguments that can be passed uh, there as well. Okay, I don't have a ton of time here, so I need to kind of get going, and then we won't worry about this one right here. Okay, so this was the init.sa, uh, and what this is also doing uh, when we when we run through this, okay, is uh, we're also going to run this this uh, sub.sh file. So this is going to go in and install everything we need on the MySQL server and get our database uh, going. So this installed the OpenCart app uh, for us by simply uh, those two state files. Now, if I go back over here to targets and I look at OpenCart, um, then essentially I can uh, look at this minion ID and look at the activity of the minion ID and then see that the state.apply occurred. So when we when we see a state.apply function, that means that we did something on the system, also state.highState. State um, but I can go in and look a little, look at um, you know, whether or not those packages got installed. So I can also look at it through here as well. I can, you know, if you don't want to see it in the raw JSON, um, you can, well, it, it's a little bit more readable here, right? Because you could say, okay, here's the packages or 18 targeted packages installed uh, from that state file, and here, here they all are. And if there was ever an error or something like that, right, we would see it in here. But we can see that this was uh, successful. So all three uh, states were successful within that, that state file that ran. Okay, and so there was the uh, last little script that we ran, then all the packages, and then up at the top, right, we should see that user uh, that got created there. Yeah. So uh, we see the user, we see the packages that got installed. So there was those three states within that one state file. We can get the raw data as well if we want to, um, so and download it. So that's a, another option here. And uh, so so that's essentially you know a file server that's going out to a system and uh, uh, a set of state files that are going out to a system and installing uh, an, an application, okay? Uh, so for the sake of time, let me go into here. So there's also one, uh, you know, a lot of different modules and functions for Windows as well. Um, so uh, like for instance, there's this win underscore server manager uh, 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 function, uh, which allows us to do stuff that you would do through server manager, right, on Windows. So what we're doing here is we're gonna install IS. Right, and we're going to name it the web server. So essentially, uh, we're going to install the IS web server role um, on a Windows machine. Uh, this is a very. This will just basically get the service installed and give you the default website, uh, and just kind of let you. It's not going to do anything else really, like like create app pools, which I'll show you that here in just a second, um, and so forth. So you can also, you know, uh, start to build out a little bit of orchestration here uh, within Salt, and uh, that would be like this include. Right, so I could also say I want to run my Apple's ISSLS and include this other uh, uh, file here. And what this means is that it will run this state when we run this state. So it's going to say, "Hey, go ahead and run this state," um, even though I'm running, I'm executing this one uh, because I might need this stuff to happen before I get into all of this. So what I'm doing here is I'm essentially going to, you know, pull some information from Jinja. Like for example, I want to set my path directory, and I could have that in a in a in pillar data, um, and that could be like this particular directory here. My default website could just be that name, my app pool, and then the uh, uh, the app pool example. So I want to create one called payroll portal, um, and then uh, you know go in and, and have all the uh, different options for creating like an app pool, for instance, uh, create directories, uh, create virtual directories, um, and so forth with an IS. So these are the type of things you can do to go in and mess with some of the services and, and install packages and services and so forth. Um, so that's, uh, I, I kind of wanted to bring that up just because of the Windows piece. Now, the other thing that we can do with Windows um, in the sense of installing applications is there's also something called a win repo uh, from uh, Salt, okay? And uh, essentially the win repo uh, is a set of pre-created state files uh, that will essentially allow you to run, uh, that you can run against Windows machines. And this is actually pretty nice. I remember when I first kind of played around with this uh, a couple of years ago or so, um, you know, I picked a bunch of them and I was like, hey, I got like 20 of these things I want to run on a Windows machine. And um, I went ahead and ran the commands to run it and it just installed all 20 of those things on the Windows machine and they were all on the desktop. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. So it was a really nice way uh, to just get apps installed on Windows and then you can tweak these uh, state files as well. So like, let's say I want to go in and install Python 
you know, three on my Windows machine. Uh, well, here's the SLS file that will do that. Um, and then what you do is you actually could download these. There's a command that automatically downloads them to salt. And then these become available uh, through a certain win repo command. You could also, I think, no, uh, there's maybe a way to do it through a state, but they usually you want to do these through the CLI, I think. So um, what you can, uh, I think you can do a module function on that uh, called the mod. But but essentially, uh, here's all the versions, right? If you're doing it through MSI or executable, you can pick which one. Uh, if you do the executable one, right, here's the name. Uh, but here's also the installer. So if you're like in an air-gapped environment or let's say uh, uh, you have a different repo uh, where you have your installer, uh, then you can change this installer directory, uh, right? We just put this in here as the default, uh, but you can go out and ch you can change this uh, and, and then have it install the, the application uh, from where you want it uh, to, to, to install. So if you need to download it first and make it available, uh, then, then you would just say, okay, this is where we need that, uh, need to pull that install from. So it could be like an internal website possibly or something like that. But as you can tell, uh, there are a lot of options here. Uh, there's a ton of them in here. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, there's there's all kinds of stuff you can install. So just kind of be aware of that, right? Uh, PowerShell stuff. I think there's even a Visual Studio one in here I've installed before, which is kind of nice. Uh, let's see if that one's still there. Um, well, hopefully it's in there. It might be in there somewhere. I don't know. I've done it before. VS Code. Oh, there it is. VS Code. Yeah. So, uh, so I've done this one a couple of times. I like this because I always try to run VS Code on my Windows machines, and I'll just run this uh, uh, against my minion there. So, okay. So, I want to just kind of bring that up because that is uh, kind of you know one of those things that um, uh, helps with sort of the Windows piece of it. Now, let me show you what we're doing with the reactor real quick. I won't have time to really dive into this too much, but just so you get an example. So, this reactor.conf is required, and even though we see this in the state in the RE Automation Config UI, this actually has to be downloaded onto your Salt Controller system, right? So Salt Beacon Service Apache 2 is uh, the the event we're looking for on the event bus, and then here's the file we're going to run. It's Apache Service SLS. Now the reason why we have to do this question mark salt env equals demo is because this file is not located in the base directory. So because it's not located in the default base directory, we need to specify the directory, and the directory is demo, and that will give us the ability to run this Apache service.sls. So if the service stops, um, then the beacon that's on that system, which is up here, yeah, this is it right here. Yeah, this is the beacon conf, and essentially what this does is it'll say, okay, if this stops then reactor do this and then here's the file that it's going to it's going to get executed um, so essentially we'll start the service um, and local service start so that's our module function and then the argument is the apache 2 service that is uh, the service we're we're uh, um, you know concerned about here so this this is a uh, this reactor Speak push and the speaking push are our files that we created here. This is just a way to push the speaking down to a minion very quickly through a job. Now, I've showed you some of the files. Let's go into some of the jobs real quick, and then I'll, I'll probably have to wrap up. Um, so in the jobs, um, this is where we can do a bunch of stuff to, to take those day two actions. So this is a nice way to take those day two actions because essentially what I can do is I can go list my services. So if I want to go see, okay, service, get all, I want to list all the services on a machine, I can run this job, uh, hit my target group, Apache, and then run that job, right? And I could do that. And then when I go back over to jobs, I could do things like also, uh, I know I had another one here. Oh, where'd they go? Get status of services. Um, so I could get the status of all, like a service I'm putting to pass an, pass an argument to. Now we could also do this through this job inputs. If I wanted to have this a drop down and have like 10 different services I'd like to get status for, uh, there could be a drop down and you could pick which one you want. Uh, but this this will go out and give me the, the, the status of that service and so forth. So let me look over here real quick at the completed so we can see uh, we get our list of services, we're getting our status of services. So if I go into list services and I click here, uh, against that Apache machine, I just want to see all the services uh, that uh, where am I at? that have been. Uh, uh, oh, I clicked on the wrong thing. Sorry, <laughs> I meant to click on the GID. Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, that was the status of the services. So this will tell me the status. 
Uh, eventually, I will click on the right one, I promise. Okay, here's the list of services, the GID. And ignore all my failures you just saw when I did. I'm always experimenting here. So um, <laughs> there's might be some jobs that weren't working right. Um, okay, so uh, when you go into here, service get that all, here's the raw. And this shows me all the services now uh, that are uh, running on that machine. So if I was like, is Apache even running here? Oh, there it is. Um, and, and so forth. We also have something called Salt Des De Describe as well, which is kind of new. We'll probably talk about that in a later a later session. So this is a way then, then what I could do is I can ultimately go in and, and create a job uh, that says, you know, start or stop um, uh, the service. And I could have sworn I created that, but maybe I didn't. Um, oh, there we go. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So, so essentially, um, uh, that's kind of about it. All I want to show, I know, I know it's, uh, you know, 10 minutes till the top of the hour. Or so, um, uh, I think I'll probably just stop it there. So we kind of looked at a few things um, in terms of being able to look at some of the services, look at some of the jobs um, and so forth. Uh, let me kind of go back to my PowerPoint here uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap up a bit. Uh, so hopefully now you know how to create a state file that are applicable to apps and services. So we looked at your services modules and functions and we looked at your uh, package and your win repo and, and all that kind of fun stuff. We didn't really be, have time to deep dive into the win repo, but there is a lot of great documentation and, and blogs and stuff that we've done out there about that. Um, and then also use, uh, uh, we didn't go into the integration today, sorry. Um, I think this was my original intention, so let's ignore that bullet point. The first one is really the one that we wanted to, to touch on uh, today. So apologies on that. Um, uh, we just didn't have time to get into that today. Okay, so um, the next session is on, uh, for at least automation, uh, the next section, in, or next, next session, uh, 928, automating the deployment of Kubernetes clusters. So this will be a really interesting one. Um, this is where we're going to leverage RE automation to provision uh, vSphere or Tanzu Kubernetes uh, clusters and, and, and work with uh, uh, and namespaces. Essentially, uh, what we can do with this is we can uh, uh, use uh, supervisor clusters uh, within vSphere and deploy TKG clusters, uh, which are, you know, your standard Kubernetes Cluster, which has a kube API, uh, you know, and all that kind of stuff. We can run kube cuddle commands, uh, but we can also do some stuff through automation to manage that, deploy it, and then go in and even deploy uh, nodes and VMs. And, and we have things like, you know, machine classes and different policies and stuff like that uh, that you can use in terms of uh, being able to manage your Kubernetes uh, environment and then ultimately deploying your apps and stuff like that. Uh, so it's really interesting topic. Um, you probably join that one if you're doing anything with with kind of you know using vSphere and VMware Cloud if you want to create you know more of that uh, developer uh, and 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 more modernizing maybe applications and stuff like that uh, in more developer feel and 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 function uh, then this will be a good good session to to jump on to. Okay, so just uh, some you know some more content out there. We have Tech Zone. Um, where we have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, we put our webinars, we have also a, a lot of information on TechZone, uh, our hands-on labs, um, our YouTube channel for our cloud management, and then our blog site, blogs.vmware.com forward slash management, is our blog site uh, for um, uh, uh, just all the blogs that we do around our multi-cloud management solution. And then, yeah, so if you click on the QR code, um, hopefully this one's still working, I hope it is, um, and uh, and so forth uh, for uh, watching today's webinar. So I think that might be all for me, um, but I really appreciate everyone joining today. Um, uh, have a great uh, day, great weekend coming up, and um, thanks for watching.